you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. We will read the first 21 verses, and that will also be our text this afternoon. And for those of you who are visiting, we've been working our way slowly through the Gospel of Mark. So the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, starting at verse 1. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And he began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Have you ever found yourself very slow at learning something new? Maybe it was learning how to serve in tennis. Maybe it was learning to use a new program at work. Maybe it was trying to grasp some profound concept in physics class. And everyone around you seemed to pick it up really, really quick. But you found that no matter how many times you repeated it, and no matter how many times it was taught to you, you found that you just couldn't get it right. You know, for some things in life, an experience like that can be frustrating, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter all that much. However, there are other things when the stakes are much, much higher. And such slowness to learn can leave us significantly crippled. Well, the most significant area in which this is the case is the area of spiritual truth. And yet the sad reality is that very often it's precisely here that men and women show great sluggishness in grasping the most critical of lessons. Who am I? Who is God? How can I be right with God? How can I walk with God? The sad fact, this is not true only of the believer who we know needs supernatural intervention to really grasp the gospel. But too often this is true of the believer. Sadly, too often Christ's rebuke of his disciples after the resurrection can be applied to us. O oh, foolish ones, 
and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Well, it's this slowness of heart to believe that we are faced with in Mark chapter 8. Now, we are nearing the, the end of the first half of Mark's gospel, and up until now, Mark's primary focus has been on the question of Christ's identity. Who is Jesus? And in fact, the transition point of the gospel is going to come later in this chapter, in verses 27 to, to 30, when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. And at that point, Christ is going to change his question from the question of his identity, and he's going to start dealing with the whole reality of his upcoming suffering and death. However, here we are right before that transition point, and what we find is that even here, after all that they had seen and heard, the disciples are still sluggish when it comes to understanding the significance of all that Christ had said and that all that Christ had done. This passage is a challenging one. It comes to us with a warning against the leaven of unbelief. This is a passage that condemns spiritual stubbornness and that rebukes spiritual sluggishness. And it's a passage that calls us to renewed and vibrant faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want to look at this passage in three scenes. In the first scene, in verses 1 to 10, we have a mighty miracle repeated. A mighty miracle repeated. Now as we come to the feeding of the 4,000, it's important for us to recognize that the way in which the account is written, very intentionally, is trying to tell us that this is a repeat of what happened in chapter 6, when, when Jesus fed the 5,000. You'll notice in verse 1 that it says, In those days when again a great crowd had gathered. And it's interesting, in both cases, the miracle of the feeding sets off a parallel series of events. We have Jesus feeding a crowd, and then it's followed by a journey in a boat, then it's followed by a disagreement with Pharisees, followed by a conversation that involves bread, followed by a uniquely detailed miracle. And so there's this, this parallel that is intended to be before us. And of course, on top of that, when we come to the description of the miracle itself, we find that the basic description is very, very similar. Now, if you remember, back in chapter 6, I noted that the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle outside the resurrection that is involved in all four Gospels. That is to say, it is an incredibly central miracle for the revelation of Christ's identity and his glory. And so Mark is intentionally highlighting for us that Christ is very purposefully repeating this central miracle to once again highlight the lessons that it had revealed. And so while some of the details are different, I mean, this, this miracle lacks the wilderness theme and the shepherd theme, that were very central in chapter 6. The same basic revelation of Christ's compassion and his identity and his provision is here. Once again, Christ declares in chapter 2, I mean verse 2, I have compassion on the crowd. He looks out and he sees the crowd and he sees them in their need and his heart goes out to them. The same thing that happened in chapter 6. Once again, it's a beautiful picture of the, the sympathy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again and again and again throughout the Gospels, we see Christ confronted by misery and need. And out of the overflowing fullness of his merciful heart, he cannot but reach out. He cannot but do something to meet the need, to alleviate the suffering. And so as has been the, the case again and again in the Gospel of Mark, Christ's compassion once again leads him to perform a miracle. And in verses 5 to 10, the same basic sequence is followed as in, verse, or as in chapter 6. And once again, the leftovers highlight the abundance of Christ's provision. And so the great revelation, the central revelation of who Christ is and what he had come to do is once more put on display, placarded before the people. God is the one who gives his people bread in the wilderness, and I'm the one who gives you bread in this world. 
Just as this bread satisfies you physically, I am the spiritual bread who satisfies you spiritually. I am the bread of life, as he says in John chapter 6. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. And once again, Christ is shown to be both the giver and the gift. He's the divine Son of God, but he's also the, the God-sent Messiah. He is God's provision for the salvation of sinful humanity. But we need to ask the question, aside from the immediate need of the crowd and, and Christ's compassion, why is there this intentional repetition? The only answer that we can give is that because despite its importance and power, the disciples had not yet understood its significance. If you have your Bibles, turn back with me really quick to chapter 6. This was right after the feeding of the 5,000 and Christ walked on the water. And he entered into the boat with his disciples. And in chapter 6, verse 52, we read that the disciples were utterly astonished for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. You see, Christ is repeating this miracle because the disciples just hadn't got it. They hadn't really got the lesson. You can, you can picture a good, patient teacher working with a student who, who just doesn't get it. And so he goes over the same lesson again and again. He comes at it from another angle. He tries to re-explain the concepts. Because you see, the teacher knows that with some subjects, if the student doesn't get this concept, they're not going to get anything in the class. That there are some concepts that are so foundational that if you don't get this, you can't continue. And so the teacher is very patient to try to make sure that the student grasps this principle. And so it is with Christ here. Christ repeats the same miracle. He patiently impresses upon his disciples this lesson. Because until they grasp this, he knew that they were not ready to hear about his suffering and death. And so you'll notice the focus on his disciples. We read in verses 1 to 3. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And so again, it's just like in chapter 6. Here's the situation unfolding, and Christ wants to take action, but before he does, he puts it before his disciples. Here's the situation, guys. What are we going to do about it? And sadly, the disciples manifest the same dullness. They manifest the same slowness that they did last time. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? You see, instead of saying, Yes, Lord, we see the need. You're right. Something needs to be done. And so you need to do something. They come to Jesus and they start asking him, Do what you did before. Feed the crowds. Instead, again, they set their minds upon the physical impossibilities of the situation, and they throw up their hands. You see, they hadn't learned who Christ is. They hadn't learned that critical lesson of dependence, to bring all of your needs to Christ because he's able to meet them. And brothers and sisters, isn't it true that sometimes the Lord needs to do this with us? And he needs to repeat the same things to us again and again and again. We go through a time of hardship and trial and, and God proves himself faithful. And then we're placed in a similar situation a little while later. And again, the unbelief crowds in. And we find ourselves overwhelmed by fear, by anxiety, and by worry. How many times do we need to hear his promises before we, before we learn to trust him? How many times do we have to fall on our faces on our own before we, before we really realize, apart from him, we can do nothing? We have so much reason to be thankful that Christ is a patient teacher. Isn't it a, a wonderful thing to know that Christ is ready to teach the same lessons again and again 
And again, rather than throwing up his hands in frustration and saying, okay, I'm going to move on with the spiritually elite and you're going to get left behind. No, the statement, the confession of every mature Christian is the confession of David in Psalm 18. Your gentleness has made me great. The gentleness of our shepherd who will not leave his sheep behind. As this mighty miracle is repeated, we see a witness and a testimony of the patience of our teacher. And so we see then a mighty miracle repeated. However, verses 1 to 10 really sets the stage for what comes next. You see, the next two scenes are placed very clearly in the context of this, this clear, repeated revelation of Christ's person. And one of the accounts that we're going to come to reveals to us the spiritual stubbornness that stands in the face of this glory. And the next one reveals a picture of spiritual sluggishness in the face of this glory. And so in our second scene, in verses 11 to 13, we see spiritual stubbornness condemned. Spiritual stubbornness condemned. Now, we're not given too many details about the interaction that will take place in these verses. However, it, it does come as, as part of the sequence of conflict that has been ongoing throughout the Gospel of Mark between Christ and the Pharisees. And specifically, our minds should go back to chapter 3, where the scribes have been publicly telling the crowds that Christ was working miracles by the power of Satan. However, the, though it stands in this this unfolding sequence of conflict, it's placed in this current context very intentionally to highlight the persistence of unbelief in the face of all that Christ had been doing, all that Christ had done. The unbelief was persisting. So look at verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. So the text very clearly indicates the the spirit in which the Pharisees came to Christ. They came to argue with him. They came to test him. That is to say, they came with a settled predisposition of unbelief and of opposition. As we read the, the request of the Pharisees, they're looking for a sign from heaven to test him. The request can sound very ignorant. I mean, even for the Pharisees, they are very aware that Christ has been working miracles. However, what we need to understand is that when the the Pharisees ask for a sign here, they're not not simply seeking another miracle. They're seeking a sign directly from heaven that will publicly and definitively prove that the miracles that Christ was doing were actually from God. That they actually had their their origin in God. Because we know, you go back to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy warns the people of God, against those who do miracles and those who do miraculous things, but teach heresy. And so they're not just looking for another miracle. They're looking for a sign of where his authority comes from. Now, of course, this is the very thing that we know they've already made up their minds about. We know where the origin of his authority is. It's from Satan. The truth is, no sign could convince the Pharisees. They were just explain away anything that came. They're not genuinely seeking a sign because they want to believe. They're testing Christ. They want to discredit Christ. They want an excuse for their unbelief. In verses 12 to 13, Christ responds. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. You see, Christ has been filling the land with proofs of his divine power. And more than that, the miracles that Christ had been doing have very clearly, very specifically, been the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies regarding what would mark the ministry of the Messiah. And the Pharisees claimed to be experts in the Old Testament, and all they had to do was sit down and objectively compare the teaching of Christ, the person of Christ, the miracles of Christ, with the promises of the Old Testament. And it could not have been more clear 
that Jesus was the one promised by the Father. And so Christ's deep sigh here reveals a sense of exasperation. We talked about this morning. A sense of exasperation. His indignation, his grief over the stubborn hard-heartedness of the Pharisees. It's the same attitude that we see in the Old Testament prophets over the sheer resoluteness of God's people to refuse his word. You know, in Psalm 120 this morning, we, we talked about the weariness that Christ must have felt as he lived among, among a contrary, disobedient, hostile people. And certainly here we have a very clear example of that. And so Christ responds to their request with a flat refusal. No. No, I'm not going to play your games. No sign will be given to this generation. Now, his resurrection would be a final conclusive sign of his identity. But at this time, he refuses to play their games. He's not going to operate upon the terms of settled unbelief. He's not going to let himself be examined by their tests of those who have already made up their minds about him. And so he simply condemns them. And he turns his back and he walks away. Brothers and sisters, this little account gives us a picture of stubborn unbelief, and it gives us a picture of Christ's attitude to stubborn unbelief. The fact is, even today, there are people who demand signs from heaven to prove the gospel to them. Maybe some of you have talked to people, you've done evangelism, and someone has said, well, if God just made himself clear to me this way, or physically, or whatever, if God just gave me a sign, I would believe. But the problem with such people is that they're coming to God from a place of arrogance, from a place of skepticism. They want God to prove himself to them on their own terms. And maybe there's someone here who's secretly doing that with God. They're holding back their hearts from him and they're saying, Lord, you have to prove yourself to me. They're not willing to dig into what he has revealed. They're not willing to compare the Old Testament to the revelation of Christ in the New they're not willing to take the time to actually study the great mountains of historical evidence pointing to the supernatural reality of what Christianity is. They won't lay bare their hearts. They won't allow God's law to convict them and expose their sin. Instead, they stand there and they demand that God come groveling to their feet and that he submit to their examinations and their demands. My friends, God will not play those games. He will not play games with settled unbelief. The living God has made himself known in a way that is so glorious, so unmistakable. And what he calls for is for radical faith. Not blind faith, because there is evidence, but faith that is willing to take Christ for who he is. Faith that comes in broken humility, recognizing you have nowhere else to turn to meet the needs of your soul. And the warning of this passage is that unbelief will never be given the sign that it demands. God will not be put to the test by unbelieving men and women. Instead, what God will do with those who are manifesting this skepticism and pride is they'll be given over to their unbelief. No sign will be given to you. Christ turns his back and he walks away and the Pharisees are left in the darkness. Destitute of the hope, the light, and the joy of the gospel. My friends, beware of the wretched, twisted reality of spiritual stubbornness that demands that God answers you on your terms. And so we see, following the mighty revelation of Christ, we see spiritual stubbornness condemned. But then in verses 14 to 21, we have spiritual sluggishness rebuked. Spiritual sluggishness rebuked. Look at verses 14 and 15. So they get into the boat, and they head over to the other side, and we read, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. 
So following the, the conflict with the Pharisees, it seems that Christ decides it's time to make a, a sudden departure in the boat. And in the hurry that followed the flurry of activity to get into the boat and depart, the disciples forget to bring provisions. Somewhere in the midst of all the, all the bustle, the person's job who was supposed to pack the lunch forgot that it was their job. And maybe as they sail away, Christ was still looking back to the shore with a sense of grief, a sense of cooling righteous anger as he thought about the Pharisees. And he takes the opportunity while the experience is fresh to give a warning to his disciples. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And the picture of leaven or the picture of yeast is often used in Scripture as a, as a picture of sin and corruption. Because of the way in which leaven or the way in which yeast subtly spreads its way, its influence through the entire lump of dough. And Christ is speaking here of the subtle evil influence of the teaching of the Pharisees and of Herod. And if we want to be specific, the leaven of the Pharisees would be formalism and legalism. And the leaven of Herod would be worldliness and skepticism. Of course, underneath both was the simple reality of unbelief. It was the evil, stubborn disposition that said, you need to show me signs, but they had already made up their minds about who Christ was. And Christ says, beware of the subtle influence of unbelief. Because it will blind you to who I am. It will shut you out of the kingdom. It will rob you of its blessings. However, in verse 16, we find that once again, the disciples missed the point. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. So the disciples had probably just realized, okay, well, we've forgotten to bring bread. And they had been discussing it, it had been on their minds. And then Christ turns and addresses them, and, and they hear his words, and they automatically make the connection between leaven and bread, and they completely forget anything about the, the, the Pharisees and Herod. And they think that Christ is rebuking them for their absent-mindedness. And so they start quarreling about who is responsible. And once again, the disciples, what we find is that they're so, so distracted by earthly considerations that they completely miss the spiritual significance of what Christ had said. They fail to weigh the fact that the one who has just twice miraculously fed thousands is in the boat with them. Now, he's not all that concerned about having one loaf with 13 men. In verses 17 to 21, Christ cuts off the disciples' discussion and he asks, a penetrating series of questions that, that does very clearly come across as a strong rebuke of their spiritual sluggishness. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember? Now, the phraseology of those questions has very clear parallels with the Old Testament prophets in their cutting rebukes of Israel. You can think of the well-known passage from Isaiah 6. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes. And it's actually very telling to look at this in the context. The account is placed side by side very deliberately with the account of the Pharisees because we're meant to see them in comparison with one another. Now there is a difference between stubbornness and sluggishness. Stubbornness speaks of something obstinate. There's a willful refusal to respond. Sluggishness, on the other hand, though it might manifest similar fruits, it lacks the willfulness. It's the difference between a child who is told to get ready for something and they, they stamp their foot and they say no. It's the difference between that and the child who is just so absent-minded and so caught up in their play that they're just distracted by everything and so they don't end up getting ready. Now, at, at the end of the day, neither of those children is ready when they're told to be ready. And maybe both of them need chastisement. 
Well, there's a great difference in the, the attitude of their heart toward the word of their parents. And I want you to realize what is so striking here is that while there is a clear difference in the heart of the Pharisees and the heart of the disciples, Christ's words here put emphasis upon the similarities. That is to say, Christ is saying, my disciples, there's too much of the Pharisees in you. There's too much of this hard-heartedness, too much of this blindness, too much of this unbelief. And so in verse 19 to 21, Christ sets the two feeding miracles again before his disciples to drive home the point of how inexcusable they are. He says, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? So Jesus asks about the, asks about the miracles and and the disciples remember the details clearly enough. Their, their eyes worked perfectly well. But they still hadn't come to the right conclusions about Christ. And they were still ignorant of the true spiritual lesson. And Christ, in essence, says, my disciples, open your eyes to who I am. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've shown myself to be. I'm God in human flesh, sitting in the boat with you. Open up your eyes. Brothers and sisters, these are strong words about spiritual sluggishness. Do you not yet understand? Have you, have you not yet learned? It's as if the Lord would come to us this afternoon and say, I'm the God of the universe. And I've entered into history for your salvation. How is it? That after years and years of studying the scriptures, years of sitting in church, how is it that you're still so distraught and so captivated and so caught up with earthly things? Now what you need to be anxious about is not your outward provisions. What you need to be fearful about is the leaven of unbelief. Teachings, mindsets, desires that, that make this present world seem so important and so pressing, but that blind you to the light of the glory and the grace of Christ. These are the things that we need to be watchful against. Brothers and sisters, we need to remember this. That at the root of all our spiritual problems and all our spiritual danger is the leaven of unbelief. This is the leaven that leavens the whole lump. This is the twisted root that produces rotten fruit. This is the, the poison fountain that corrupts all the streams. Our greatest problem in our Christian lives is not so much this particular sin or that particular sin. The greatest problem in our Christian lives is our spiritual dullness. That we don't lay hold of Christ in the fullness of who he is. Because you see, it makes us blind to the fact that Christ is the bread of life. And so we go out and we go seeking after this world or we go seeking after sin to satisfy us. We lose sight of who it is that's in the boat with us and so we become so distressed and preoccupied by outward hardships. And sometimes we need to hear the rebuke of Christ. Brothers and sisters, spiritual sluggishness is not okay. It's not okay. Now, there is a difference. There is a difference between the condemnation of the Pharisees and the rebuke of the disciples. But spiritual sluggishness is not okay. We need to reorder our priorities and realize that the most weighty things in life are spiritual things. That this world is passing. Its concerns, its cares, its pleasures, its pursuits, they're passing. They're ephemeral. They're here today and gone tomorrow. But the things of Christ, the things of our souls, they are eternal. And we need to do more than just intellectually acknowledge that Christ is who he says he is. We need to, we need to labor and we need to pray that that realization would permeate our lives, captivate our souls, transform our outlook, govern our actions. Because again, 
Go back to that illustration of the patient teacher going over the same lesson with his student. Why? Why would he go over the same lesson again and again with his student? It's because he realizes they're not ready for the next lesson until they've mastered this one. You see, the lesson that the disciples were not ready for was the lesson of the cross. It was the lesson of suffering. And brothers and sisters, hard times are ahead of us as Christians and as the church. That's promised to us in Scripture. The signs of the times are unmistakable. Trial, temptation, persecution, hardship are ahead of us. But we need to realize we will not be ready for the lesson of suffering unless the lesson of Christ's identity, his glory and his sufficiency has not gripped our souls. And so I would say to you, beware of the leaven of unbelief. Beware of anything that makes spiritual things weigh lightly upon your soul. Beware of being caught up in worldly things in such a way that the, the wonder and the beauty and the glory of Christ no longer moves you and no longer motivates you. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Throw off every weight and the sin that entangles and run the race. As we step back, and we think about this passage as a whole. What I find so striking is that Christ's strong words here to his disciples worked. Christ's rebuke might have been cutting to his disciples. I'm sure they felt, felt miserable about themselves afterwards. Rebukes tend to do that. Conviction tends to do that. Christ's words are cutting, and they cut us. They cut me. What I find so interesting is that it worked. It woke his disciples up. Because in the very next passage, we come to the transition point where the lights come on and Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. And Christ proceeds to begin teaching them the lessons of suffering. And brothers and sisters, if there is anything that we need to pray for with fear and trembling, it is that the Lord would purge the leaven of unbelief from our hearts. Whatever it takes, Lord, search me and try me. Cut me and convict me and rebuke me. Discipline me and prune me. Whatever it takes, take the dimness of my soul away. Purge away my unbelief, this root of sin. Get rid of it. Get rid of my pride. And increase my faith. Because you see, then, then we'll be ready to take up our cross. Then we'll be ready to bear witness to Christ. Then we'll be ready to suffer for his name. So may God give us grace to hear the words of Christ, to take them to heart, and to pray that he would continue his work, purging our unbelief and increasing our faith. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we face this rebuke of our Savior. Father, we confess it does cut us, partly because of our priorities, but partly, Lord, just because of the sluggishness of our own hearts. We live so much by sight and not by faith. And yet, in a sense, Lord, we stand here helplessly before you, recognizing that it is a work of your Spirit to give us more faith. And so we do pray with you, Lord, in confession, for our slowness to believe all that you have spoken. But we pray also, Lord, for the grace of your Spirit to more and more be to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. May your word, O Lord, would penetrate and govern and transform. We pray, O Lord, we plead with you that you would come and do your work within us more and more, leading us on that we might run with endurance the race that is marked before us. We thank you. We thank you for your word that is so honest that cuts us as well as heals us. And so, Lord, do cut us, but also heal us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.